Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Finley, Vice President of Leadership Council here at the Jordan Snitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. I'd like to welcome our JSMA community, patrons, members, students, and faculty, and welcome to our audience at large from across the country. We are delighted to host this event with internationally celebrated art critic and biographer Blake Gopnik, who will talk about his recent book, Warhol, a landmark achievement in biography, now heralded as the definitive work on this enigmatic artist. I'd like to thank the JSMA and the University of Oregon for hosting this talk, our director, John Weber, Debbie Williamson Smith, excuse me, and our communications team, and Paul Nordquist for his assistance with all things technical. I am here to introduce Blake Gopnik, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for over 20 years, first as a formidable art critic, then a valued friend. Blake comes from one of our great intellectual families, and he certainly holds his own among them. He was raised in Montreal, where he received his BA from McGill University in Medieval Studies in Latin, then earned his PhD in Art History from Oxford University. I met Blake when he came to Washington, D.C. from Toronto, where he was art critic for The Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper. He was hired as chief critic for The Washington Post just around the time my husband Patrick and I were opening our contemporary gallery. Blake brought an international standard and perspective to the Post's art coverage and profoundly raised the bar for art criticism and intellectual discourse in DC. He was generous, always gracious, and became an integral part of the arts community there. After 12 illustrious years at the Post, he moved to New York and would become art and design critic for a number of prestigious print and online publications, including the New York Times, Newsweek, Artnet, The Daily Beast, and Marketplace Radio. Blake began work on his Warhol biography in 2013 and spent the next seven years immersed in the project. In 2015, he was named a fellow at the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York. And in 2017, he was awarded a fellowship at the Pullman Center of the New York Public Library, where he became legendary as a power user, arriving at the library before opening and staying until after closing. This research went along with his unprecedented access to the, war to the archives of the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, which literally consists of hundreds of thousands of objects and documents. This book is a major achievement and a gift to the art historical canon. It is an incredibly comprehensive and fascinating narrative of the time, the place, the ideas, and the people who shaped the artist Andy Warhol. Blake will sit down today with our own John Weber, a Warhol aficionado himself, so it should be an illuminating and spirited conversation. As a point of reference, we have hung some stunning Warhols from our own collection, along with a seminal painting by Warhol's contemporary Jean-Michel Basquiat from our Shared Visions program. This program brings world-class works from private collections into the JSMA galleries. I am so happy to say that we are open again to the public so you can come and see these works in person. Time tickets are available on the JSMA website, Copies of Blake's wonderful book are available at the museum store, as well as Black Sun Books and Tsunami Books, two local independent booksellers, and at Powell's Books in Portland. The book is, of course, also available at all major bookstores and online. We will also provide links in the chat where you can find Blake online. Also, we will make time at the end of the program for questions from the audience. You are welcome to type them in the Q&A sidebar at any time, but we will address them at the end. So Blake, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. And John, thank you. I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for getting us off to a great start today and also for putting us in touch with Blake and really, uh, really making sure that this thing happened. Um, it's great to have everyone here today. Blake, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, first of all, congratulations for Warhol. It is an immense achievement, and it's a major contribution to the history of American art, and really, I think, um, 20th and 21st century history, too. Uh, it's a, also a great read, I have to, to tell everybody. Um, I, I really enjoyed reading it. So what I'm going to do is, and what our plan is, we've got a number of images here and a few themes that we're going to try to get through. But as Blake was saying in preparation for this, we could probably talk for an hour about any one of our individual topics. Uh, Warhol is so rich and there's there's so much to say and, and he knows more about Warhol than I think anyone else 
um, in the world ever has or maybe ever will. So <laughs> there's a lot to say. So I'm going to do a screen share and you'll still see small pictures of us, um, but we're gonna, we wanna be able to look at some of the things that we're talking about. So first of all, let's- I should say, John, that I've, I've, you know, the old saying, I've forgotten more than anyone else knows about Warhol. And that's literally true because I've already <laughs> forgotten so much. I okay. once was, overflowing with Warholiana, and now I'm just sort of filled with Warholiana. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll have enough to get us through an hour. <laughs> it was, uh, okay, it, well, let's start easy. with, we're here really, um, both because of the artist, but particularly because of the book. So let's start with the book and, and how you came to write it. You devoted, as Sarah said, seven years of your life to this project. So tell us about that, um, how your interest in Warhol built and then culminated in this immense um, history, uh, one of America's greatest artists. Well, you know, as a as a practicing art critic, a full time art critic, you end up writing about Warhol in a sense, whether you like to or not. I mean, one of the things about being a newspaper art critic is that shows open and you write about them. So in a way, you don't get to choose your interests yourself. And I ended up writing quite a lot about Warhol and kept being surprised by how interested I was in him. Um, I have to say, uh, and I've told this story before. I actually had known Warhol literally since I was a tiny kid, since 1967 probably, because my parents bought a Warhol poster when I was little and it stood on the wall of our bathroom. So I can say that I sat <laughs> contemplating that Warhol Maryland from a very young age, but it, it may have seeped into my psyche, but I hadn't thought a lot about Warhol until I started writing about him. And then I found him sort of inexhaustible as an art critic. And then at a certain point when I was sort of casting around for books that seemed to need writing, it suddenly just became clear that Warhol was this giant figure that didn't have a really comprehensive biography. A few biographies have been written, you know, soon after his death and they weren't written by art critics or art historians even, mostly <laughs> not anyways, they were written by journalists. So it seemed to me we needed a really thorough biography of Andy Warhol that looked at his formation in his early years, that looked at his late work as well. I mean, when I ended up writing about Warhol as an art critic, for some reason I kept writing about the late Warhol and was really interested in that. And that had always been slighted before. So mm -hmm. I really just wanted to look at the whole career and it just seemed obvious to me that we needed to really come to grips with him. And I was also very lucky that um, at just the moment that I wanted to start writing this book, his archive in Pittsburgh was, uh, it wasn't fully cataloged, but it had been reorganized and inventoried in a way it never had been before. So I was really lucky that at just the moment that I wanted to write, start writing my book, it was clear that it was, it was writable in a sense, because these papers, these uh, just insane quantities of papers were available to be looked at, including, you know, uh, just about every invoice he ever sent out. And, you know, <laughs> ticket stubs for every show and movie he went to in the 50s and early 60s, his day books. I mean, name a category of paper that any human being could own, and he owned it and kept it. It, it was one of the glories and tortures of writing the book. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Yeah, well, you mentioned that he was virtually a hoarder in the last 15 or 20 years of his life, and how many, how, how many rooms full of stuff he had and bags of things. And of course, then there's the time capsules. So you mentioned writing about um, late Warhol a lot. And so we're gonna start, um, as we agreed on, we'll start with this, this late piece on the right. This was on, the, on view on our walls until fairly recently. Unfortunately, we had to send it back, but it's one of his, his Rorschachs, which is a good example of the late Warhol. And it's a very ghostly one. So could you um, trace back through this and talk about this as an as a intriguing moment? It's a very challenging piece, really. Yeah, I mean, that's why I was so keen on starting with this. I mean, the problem with talking about Warhol, looking at Warhol, is there are a few canonical pieces, iconic pieces. They get, in a sense, too much attention. It's not that they're great. The Campbell Soup can paintings are fabulous. The Marilyns are fabulous, important works of art. But there's a tendency to dwell too much on those. And because they're so familiar, I don't think we recognize how challenging they were from the get-go. And here's mm -hmm. a 1983 uh, painting. Warhol always liked to talk about these works, all of his works really that were on canvas as paintings. Mm -hmm. And it's just a strange ghostly image, right? It's white on white. So it immediately ties in. I mean, I could talk forever about all the different things that this ties into in Warhol's life and in the history of art. So it's white on white. It's essentially a monochrome, right? It's 
uh, figurative in that it represents this figure in culture, the figure of the Rorschach blot that's so important for 20th century culture and psychology, but it's also clearly abstract at the same time. Um, it's goofy. I mean, what could be <laughs> sillier than making, in a sense, a fake Rorschach blot and calling it great art, uh, insisting that this is what you're going to do as a certified great artist. I mean, I can go on and on. Just today, um, I rediscovered a fact that I actually knew but had somehow forgotten. And I don't think I put it in the book itself, which is that Rorschach blots were used to, um, to weed out homosexuals from the military at just the moment that Warhol was called up for the draft and demoted to 4F, almost certainly because they decided he was gay or he let it be known that he was gay. So the Rorschach blot, I think, had a history for him in, um, in the history of Warhol as a gay, a gay figure, which is, as, as you know, vitally important to my book. And then when I was looking, I mean, one of my the favorite things that I did in writing my book is I found the textbooks that Warhol owned in college. And sure enough, he had a textbook for abnormal psych and inside one of the only images in it was a Rorschach blot. So mm -hmm. in Warhol, this keeps happening. Things that happened to him early in life burble up again later and you never know if it's coincidental or not. And the fact you can't tell is sort of typical of what makes Warhol so great. I mean, is this a kind of idiotic painting or is it actually really, really deep and complex? And I, in a way it's an idiotic painting or rather it's a complex painting pretending to be superficial and idiotic. And, and yeah. it's typical of how you can never come to the end of Warhol. We could talk, yeah. I swear, for this hour about this one painting. Yeah, no, I can imagine because it's on the one hand, it's sort of a thing, but it's a picture of a thing at the same time. And it's a thing that's not supposed to reveal anything about the maker. It's supposed to reveal something about the looker, which is us, not the artist, which is the opposite of what we normally expect art to do. Exactly. And let's not forget, this is just the moment when expressionist painting was coming back mm -hmm. in the market and in, in art history. So it's kind of funny mm -hmm. that this non-expressive expressionist image is mm -hmm. what decides to contribute to the great rebirth of painting in the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah. It's clearly tongue in cheek. And another thing that's important to say, I think, uh, because this carries over through his whole career is that he's always accused, especially in the late work of selling out, right? Mm -hmm. That he was only yeah. doing works yeah. in order to sell them, in order to make yeah. money. Well, that's an absurdity with these Rorschach blots. No one yeah. bought them, no one wanted to buy them. I don't think he ever showed them in fact, in during his lifetime, the only, uh, early purchase of a Rorschach blot, and this is great, was Jasper Johns, mm -hmm. uh, Warhol's great, you could say, mentor almost in, yeah. in post-abstract art. And he yeah. bought a white on white Rorschach, or rather traded his works to yeah. Warhol for a white on white, white yeah. Rorschach. So the great That's Jasper so Johns was smart enough to realize that these were great. Yeah. That's so interesting. And of course, it's also in a certain sort of funny way, like a it has a bit, a bit of an echo of abstract expressionism and a kind of all over feel to it. But then yeah. it has this, you, you point out a lot on um, Warhol's uh, admiration for John Cage. And there's this element of the, the accidental in, in Rorschach tests. Although apparently he had, to, you, you say that he had to work very hard to get them just right. And whereas he could farm out some of his production to assistants. And in this case, I think you were saying that he really had to, he had to supervise them, really do them all himself. He so. farmed out way less than people think than he pretended. Mm -hmm. I think he didn't farm it out much more than any artist does. I mean, trivial stuff he farmed out, mm -hmm. uh, but but he farmed out less than we think. And the other yeah. funny thing about these Rorschachs is they're not Rorschach blots. Right. <laughs> the Rorschach blot is that they're standardized. Everyone looks at the same blot and right. comes to their own reading. Yeah. Andy Warhol claimed that he didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Even quote him saying that in the book as though it's true, but with Warhol, you never know when he's playing right. dumb, when he's being dumb. I right. think he knew perfectly well that he was making non Rorschachs as he pretended yeah. to make. Yeah. Well, one of the points you make again and again and very effectively is Warhol was an extremely canny artist who thought deeply about what he was doing, what his position was. He was an avant gardist um, through and through. And this notion of him as a sort of an easy popularizer is a complete misreading, as you just said, of how tough the work was all along. And so let's go, we can jump back now to, um, to the series that comes after some of the earlier work. It's the Death and Disaster series. And um, it's a great example of Warhol giving his audiences, just as he begins to get going as a sort of you know, figure of pop art, he gives this really tough set of works that are not easy to digest even to this day, I think. 
Yeah, it's funny. The standard story about these so-called death and disasters pictures, and here we're looking at an electric chair, obviously, or at least for those who know. Yeah. Um, but he Peter Brandt's electric chairs. Yeah, I mean, he also did um, images of black marchers being attacked by police dogs. He did suicides. He did, oh, we have that, good. He did um, car accidents, uh, death from tuna fish poisoning, all sorts of grim images. And it's often said that he turned from his early, you know, light-spirited works to these tougher ones. But these come so soon after the early light-spirited works that it doesn't mm -hmm. make sense to see a kind of, uh, uh, you know, an oceanic shift in his production. It's, you know, these come very soon after the Campbell Soups. Mm -hmm. So it's not right to think that, oh, he was this light-hearted uh, pop artist and then he makes these tougher images. The tougher images are virtually from the same period. I mean, Marilyn Monroe is a tough image. In fact, the Campbell mm -hmm. soup cans are tough images, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the electric chairs are doubly tough. I mean, the, the death penalty was really in debate in New York state at just this moment. This is the death penalty. This is the electric chair, excuse me, that killed uh, Julius Nethel Rosenberg in 1953. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's politics here, right? I mean, Warhol's immersed in left-wing, the left-wing avant-garde in New York, who at this point saw the, the execution of the Rosenbergs as, as hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And yet he turns them into colorful images. It's, I think, a mistake to see these as simply normal, politically informed art. They're politically informed art that also sort of is pretending that they're just wallpaper. So mm -hmm. they have that mm -hmm. very strange neutrality, mm -hmm. uh, a refusal to come down on one side or another, which is what makes Warhol, even his political work, so much more interesting than more straightforward kind of message spinning that you yeah. get. Yeah. Well, um, can you talk a little bit about um, the sort of American um, versus, versus European re response to Warhol? Because I've lived in Germany a couple of times, and Warhol is really seen as an extremely political artist there for the most part, I would say, and that European artists perceive him that way too. They certainly look at the look at pieces like this or the um, race riot here. Um, here's another view. Um, this is in MoMA's galleries, and, and they, they, they tend to see his politics a lot. And I, I certainly get that, and I, I, I agree with that too, but I also think it is complex. And as you say, he's, it's more like he's posing a question as to what do we as, as lookers want to uh, bring to this? What attitudes do we have, do we hold, versus what is he telling us to think? Because it's not clear he's telling us to think anything, but he's, he's certainly asking us to, to contemplate and think about something. Yeah, I mean, there's a term that I've been using lately uh, that's a sort of crucial element in art that we've lost track of, strangely, and that is what philosophers might call ostention. That art simply points at things, and that's one of its mm -hmm. jobs, and without necessarily stylizing, idealizing, uh, politicizing, that one of the things it's always done is just said, look at this. And that's something that's very important to Warhol, but not just Warhol, to everyone in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. Could art just indicate the world after decades of abstraction? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think that that it's easy for us to lose track now um, of just how political that an image like the the so-called race riot. It's not a riot at all. It's it's cops, you know, attacking black marchers. Mm -hmm. Those would instantly and were instantly seen as politically engaged. In 1963, you couldn't show an image like this and not pretty much be seen as being on the side of the marchers. I think it was almost impossible for them not to be read that way. Yeah. And these were made for a show that Warhol wanted to have titled Death in America. So you can imagine that show might not have gone over big in America. And in fact, it didn't. These are first shown, all the death and disasters are first shown in Paris by Ileana Sonnabend. And they get, a, they get received by the Parisian critics, by European critics as unbelievably tough. And they're about a rejection of kind of consumerist America they're not at all the reading that you get of Warhol as a kind of lighthearted artist in America. And that launches Warhol as the political artist. These were probably more or less unshowable in the United States. One assumes that Leo Castelli, who would soon be Warhol's dealer, simply refused to show them and they were shown instead at his the sort of Paris branch uh, that was owned by, by Castelli's ex-wife. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I don't think we can underestimate the sheer power of these objects. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, Warhol's effort to complicate that by yeah. doubling the image, tripling the image, doing it in pink, right? There's mm -hmm. a deliberate effort to muck with stuff in doing that, I think. There's something about scale here too. Um, th this is a, here, this is a museum view. Um, Warhol made things in a lot of different scales all the time. You have single individual 
uh, images of the of the electric chair, and you have smaller versions of the um, quote race riot unquote piece. But then you have these big ones, and they declare themselves as things that are really, really very public. I would say. Um, when, yeah, they're altarpiece sized, right? They're in the tradition right. of the great altarpieces of the Renaissance. The only thing I'd say about them is that there is a way in which by duplicating his images, large, small, he's producing them in different colorways, right? He's, he's engaged in a kind of marketing exercise. And I think he was deeply aware of the problem of the art market in almost everything he did and was, was ironizing the, those problems. And was, mm -hmm. you know, he was always producing things that could be mistaken for goods. But of course, that's true of the most sober-minded artist one could imagine. Um, you know, here we have a picture that Warhol claimed uh, he added that blank canvas to only to make it sell for more money. Now, that's the kind of claim he made, but of course, it's ridiculous. It's going to sell less well, right, because it has a stupid blank canvas, not better. The notion that this would double the value, yes, the thing gets bigger, but it also gets dumber. Right. So the notion that Warhol was only doing this to make money is one that he propagated, but makes no real sense. Mm -hmm. There is no art form tougher than the monochrome, right? Yeah, yeah no, that's absolutely true. When I was at the uh, Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, um, I used to review all the comment cards because I was in charge of education and public programs. And the comment card we got more than any other comment card, we say, what did you like best about your visit? Uh, the building, what did you like worst? one color paintings. <laughs> That's great. Again, they're not saying monochrome because the vocabulary isn't there, but it's paintings of one color. Why would anyone want that? <laughs> Do you have any uh, Eve Kleins? Um, yeah, we had a we had a blue, exactly. Yeah, we had, we had a table and we had a blue painting. We actually did do a show there called, uh, well, it was a group of small um, installations uh, called Points of Departure, and they were different thematic ones. And one of them was called One Color, No Color. And it was about artists who work with, with one color or no color. And why did the museum value those so much? And why would a serious artist make a panel of a single color? It's, it's not a dumb question. It's actually a really good question. Is the question, I mean, it's a hot question, especially in 1963. I mean, one of my favorite discoveries, I mean, there are dozens of discoveries I was really happy to make with the book, but one was that it looks to me, the evidence isn't great, but it looks to me that Eve Klein, who's one of the first people to make a monochrome painting, his great mm -hmm. all blue paintings, yep. it looks like Warhol and he had substantial contact at mm -hmm. a moment. When you look at what Klein wrote about, a lot of it could sounds like a direct response to Warhol. Mm -hmm. and he's, just at the moment, we know they met, and yeah. it looked to me as though there was real contact in both directions. Yeah, and yeah. Really, it's a deep influence. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Anyway, um, in the, on the right hand side of this, we've got um, some of the most wanted men, and as you mentioned, uh, Warhol's identity as a gay man is is a really important theme of the book. You do a tremendous job of unpacking that, uh, looking at it um, sympathetically and in detail, in great detail. Um, and yet, yet in recent art history, reading an artist through their biography has been often very sort of a controversial thing to do. I happen to think you make a, a terrific case for that and that it's, there's no way to understand Warhol uh, without um, un looking at his identity. And so I thought we should talk about this for a bit. And as I, as I propose, we could start with the series Most Wanted Men that he did for the World's Fair and I believe 1964. That's so right. there's a whole story about this piece, this work of art, but then there's the, the, the greater story. And if you could take this in whatever direction you'd like to take it. Um, that would yeah, be again, this, this is an hour long talk right there, but I'll just briefly <laughs> say, so this was commissioned by Philip Johnson, who mm -hmm. had been the curator of, arch of, of architecture at MoMA. Um, and it's important to know that Philip Johnson was gay. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a work being commissioned by a gay artist, by a gay artist. Um, which is a picture of all of these kind of thuggish men. They were actually, this is taken direct from uh, uh, police uh, most wanted men flyer, uh, which had been delivered to Warhol by a gay cop actually. <laughs> um, but interestingly, so it's often, you know, the piece is called most wanted men. And there has been a lot of talk about this from the point of view of queer theory. And mm -hmm. I'd known that and I was looking for the queer connection in it. And after digging into this quite a bit, and I found a new article written at the time about the, this, these paintings, which were taken down almost immediately, right? Mm -hmm. They barely were on the wall of the building for long. And, you know, it's sort of become ex almost accepted that there was a problem with the homosexuality in them. But I actually think that in this case, 
the, the homosexuality was completely closeted. That is, Warhol and his friends would have known, I mean, this is, you know, this could easily be a photograph of rough trade from the period, right? A very, this is just the kind of young man that Warhol was attracted to. In fact, one of his lovers, uh, just a few years later, looked a huge amount like this figure, who's one of the most wanted men. But I couldn't find a bit of evidence that anyone knew that this was called the most wanted men, that that was only what it might've been called in Warhol's own internal circle. Oh. And it looks like when the thing went up, the problem was that it was on the outside of a pavilion that was meant to celebrate um, New York State, the greatness of New York State, and to celebrate New York State by having a bunch of criminals on the, on the, uh, on the out, outside of the building. That was the problem. So what I'm trying to get at here is that homosexuality was so forbidden, just talking about it in public was virtually completely forbidden, that I think it was actually, most people were oblivious to that connection, that you had to be so closeted in 1964 still, that the average New Yorker wouldn't, it wouldn't even have crossed their mind that an artist could have made an explicitly homosexual mural for the New York State Pavilion. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, I do think that every single person in Warhol's own circle would have understood the joke. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Warhol would have called it most wanted men among his familiars. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then it gets, it gets painted out. Warhol silvers it out. Um, because there's such an uproar around it. And into, it's, I mean, it's, what's amazing is there's some documentation, there are letters back and forth. There are a bunch of different people who give stories about why it was painted out. And we really don't know the real answer, right? Mm -hmm. There's one story is that they were all, there were too many Italian last names. So it made a look as though all Italians were gangsters. Right. Right. That's one story. It's yeah. not clear that's true. Um, <laughs> But there's something glorious about it being painted out in silver, neutralized. Uh -huh. Warhol, I'm sure he wasn't happy to have his mural painted out, but it, but he was the one clearly who suggested it being be silvered out. And I uh -huh. think that he was ha he wanted uh, the cancellation, the censorship on display, in a sense. Uh -huh. um, was it clear to you when you started the book that that um, dealing with his identity as gay man was going to be a, a key theme of it? You know, it was clear to me it had to be because there'd been enough writing, just enough writing on him in sort of queer theory worlds. But what happened was that when I was studying the 40s in Pittsburgh, I just found out how uh, uh, amazingly there's quite a bit of information available, archival information about what it was to be gay in Pittsburgh in the 40s and early 50s. And it was a living nightmare. It was unbelievably, I mean, I've talked about this before, but um, there was a special police squad created called the Moral Squad, but it wasn't involved in any morality except persecuting gay men. In its first two weeks of existence, it shot two gay men. It was absolutely brutal. You know, Warhol came of age as a man and as a gay man at just the moment this squad was created and he graduated from college at just that moment. Mm -hmm. um, being gay in Pittsburgh was just a living nightmare. I mean, you really took your own, your life into your hands to be at all out and Warhol was extremely out. I mean, he wore a pink suit, he wore white nail polish. He couldn't have been more, more campy, more explicitly gay, uh, mm -hmm. more out, um, but he dared to do it, which is quite extraordinary that he had the courage to do that. I mean, one of his sort of graduation paintings from Carnegie Tech, where he went to, to art school, uh, was a naked picture of himself as a little boy wearing girls Mary Janes, or not really as a little boy because he's got chest hair. So it's really a naked, full frontal safe portrait wearing a girl's Mary Janes. No one else in his graduating class was painting, painting pictures. He also has a finger stuck up his nose. No one else. He sort of kept that finger up his nose, I would say metaphorically, for yeah. the rest of his life. Yeah. That was really, despite seeming like a kind of sweet, um, uh, figure in pop culture. He really, in a way, had contempt for the mainstream. Uh -huh. He really was felt, I think, hard done by the mainstream. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Imagine that when he was 18, 19, how he felt towards mainstream Pittsburgh. Yeah. But he was a gay man. He knew he had to be closeted even when he was attacking the, the mainstream culture, I think. You talk a lot about how the work has this tension in it, in a sense, between it, it, it sort of both wants to reveal and wants to not reveal at the same time. Um, that it sort of says things and doesn't say things. That it that there's a way that it's 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 um, very it's very sort of cleverly positioning itself. And that Warhol again, he's never this naive that he seems to be. Maybe in the early '60s, that he's always um, being very careful about how he presents himself uh, to the world 
And even for a man who's out, you know, he, he's, he's still modulating that very carefully. He shows up in the 60s and he's with Edie Sedgwick, yeah. um, for example. Of course, he was also just really fascinated by her. Um, so, yeah, it's amazing how many people called her his girlfriend. How many people could actually be unaware that Warhol, the campiest, queerest gay man of the 60s, might not be gay? Mm -hmm. um, was, you know, and I think what you just said about revealing and not revealing is the was the gay predicament of a man who grew up in the 40s and 50s, came of age as a gay man. You both wanted to reveal, celebrate even your homosexuality, but you couldn't. You had to also closet. And I think that that tension really informs all of his art. It's thematized even, you could say, mm -hmm. in all of his art. I mean, what in a sense could be more queer than becoming just a silver surface, right? Both campy mm -hmm. as could be, but also mm -hmm. completely non-revealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's um, a reading, and this is one of the pieces that's in our in our museum now too, one of the flower series. And, um, you know, one of the readings that, that, that this could be that they're, I mean, I don't think that they are pansies, but um, but there is, I have read some scholarship on Warhol where it talks about sort of showing these flowers is also a way to kind of almost, you know, stick a finger up in the air. Oh, and, absolutely. They are, I would say in 50% of the period coverage of them, they are called pansies. Okay. And yeah. I bet that was, especially the criticisms of them, I bet that was meant as a slur, deliberately mm -hmm. getting the flower wrong so that you can call Warhol a pansy in a, in a family newspaper. Yeah, uh -huh. that's interesting, without having to sort of say it in a way. Um, yeah, you couldn't accuse him of being gay because it would have been too ferocious an accusation. You couldn't even say yeah. the word homosexual virtually, right? Yeah. You had to uh -huh. closet even yeah. your, your homophobia. Yeah. Anyway, this this um, the series here, the the flowers come. I think this is his, is this his first show at Leo Castelli when he moves to Castelli. Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. In sixty four, uh, November of sixty four, he shows these. So not that long after, you know, later in the same year that he showed the deaths and disasters, uh -huh. and they're definitely something wallpaperish around about them. I mean, he showed them, you know, uh, well, he showed them at uh, covering the walls virtually at Castelli. They are very close to textile design, and it's worth knowing that Warhol literally designed textiles. People don't realize that. <laughs> uh, earlier, actually, at just about this moment, he was making extra money uh, designing 60s, a uh, 50s style textiles, not pop textiles. Um, mm -hmm. And they're clearly a joke about art as much as anything, that art's only decoration. I like to use the word colorways for these. They come in different colorways, which is what you use, the word you use when you're talking about fabric. And one of my favorite bits of research, I've said that about 10 times already in this last half hour, but another of my favorite bits of research was about the sudden uh, emergence of Marameco textiles at exactly mm -hmm. this moment in, yep. in culture, that they were, they were even uh, called I uh, can't remember the exact wording, but something like the, the flower pattern for the intelligentsia, right? Mm -hmm. These were kind of high-end textiles coming from, from Finland. And I think yeah. these tie in directly to this. I mean, this is just the moment, of course, where flower power is being born in the 60s. Mm -hmm. That really is a 66, a 1966 really uh, term, but it's clearly being born at just this moment. The decorative is a signature move of the 60s counterculture is mm -hmm. being born. And I think Warhol has a part in, in giving birth to it. But of course, these are also being presented in the most prestigious gallery in New York. So they count as high art. And I just wrote a very long essay that's going to be coming out um, in the fall, probably, about Warhol as an artist, which sounds crazy, I know, to have to say that Warhol was an artist. <laughs> but it's incredibly important to me, and I think to understanding Warhol, to realize that he was completely immersed in the tradition of high art right? Capital H, capital A. That's the world he wanted to be in. It's the world he was presenting himself to. And the whole, you know, I'm just a goofy guy in pop culture was an element in his high art practice. But mm -hmm. it wasn't. So he was never really, I think, committed to pop culture. He was committed to pop culture insofar as it was the most interesting move for a high artist to make. And the, the, I think the flowers are uh, one of the crucial places where that complicated ironic move happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you talk about in your book how in the studio if reporters come by, he's always got pop music blaring, but what he really loved was opera. <laughs> That's right. 
or even Bach. I mean, one of his yeah. main dealers came by and he had Bach on. Sometimes he'd play Bach and rock music at the same time, <laughs> um, which must have been a little confusing on the ears. Right, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. um, ferociously complicated. Yeah, and um, he also, another thing too that you mentioned is he doesn't, he actually is not very economically successful in the first half of the 60s. He was a commercial artist, and we're not going to get into that today because it's too, it's, it's interesting, but there's too many other things to talk about. He was making a lot more as one of New York's most successful commercial artists by the end of the 50s than he started making until deep into the 60s from his art. Um, he did manage to sell quite a few of the flower paintings, though. But not sold out by any means. I'm sure there was a large inventory that didn't sell. They didn't sell for very much money, among other right. things. They were cheap. And he's con at this point, he's still making, I would probably guess, we don't have the exact figures, but most of his money by doing 1950 style cutesy pie illustrations as late mm -hmm. as 1966. So yeah. he's actually subsidizing his practice as a serious pop artist by selling very unserious um, commercial illustrations that he was frankly fairly ashamed of by mm -hmm. this at, the, at that point yeah okay well um let's move on to um alexander the great this is also at the jsma and it's from a series from um, 1982 i believe he does a whole series of different prints he's often working with um, ronald feldman i think in new york for yeah. some of them i don't know about this series maybe you can tell us i think um there's a different um dealer who works with him on this eolus maybe eolus gallery yeah, I mean, the amazing thing about Eolas, Alexander Eolas, so the reference to Alexander the Great, and, and in fact, people referred, apparently have referred to Eolas as Alexander the Great. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alexander uh, Eolas, now the story's a little confused, but Warhol's first solo show anywhere ever is at Alexander Eolas's gallery um, called the Hugo Gallery in 1952 in New York, and it's it's images based on short stories by Truman Capote. It fails dismally. It barely gets reviewed. It doesn't sell. Um, but one of the important things to know about Alexander Yolas is he was one of the most flamboyant gay men in New York. I mean, he had been a very successful ballet dancer. And he was, you know, uh, the walls of the gallery, they say, were covered in blue velvet. I mean, he was an incredibly campy figure. Um, and he claimed that he spotted Warhol as a cute guy on the street and offered him the show because of that. Um, the show in 1952. So later in 83, uh, I think that these are actually commissioned by Alexander Yolas, who Warhol's back into contact with. And it's very important also to recognize that Alexander is one of the earliest figures in Western culture to have been thought to be gay. So he mm -hmm. had his boyfriend, another general, one of his generals called Hephaestus, um, so there's a whole gay subtext to showing an image of Alexander and it's classic Warhol that he might have pretended not to know that, but would have known it absolutely perfectly well that he was showing um, that he was showing uh, one of the first most most famous and most powerful gay men in Western culture, obviously. But there's also a kind of I hadn't thought of it till just now, but there's a real um, um, uh, mugshot quality to these right where he's both in profile and then in three quarter profile. So there's a direct connection to the most wanted most man. Most wanted man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think the trick with any of these later prints, especially, is not to look at them for their their uh, aesthetic values, because they're in some sense fairly superficial aesthetically, but to realize that there's a subtext. And with Warhol, it's always the subtext that dominates, I think, that's most interesting. Yeah, uh, well, like, per 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 um, particularly towards the second half of the book, you make the point consistently that um, we, we have to understand Warhol as also a conceptual artist, that he's fundamentally an idea-driven conceptual artist, even if the ideas are taking this visual form, they aren't simply what you see, they're, they're how what you see is configured, how it's positioned, um, what it's doing historically, uh, the, the various subtexts that are there, and so yeah, he's a conceptual artist. Yeah, from beginning to end, almost beginning to end, I would say. And, you know, I mean, Marcel Duchamp loved mm -hmm. Warhol specifically as a conceptual artist, as a Duchampian artist. He said that very explicitly. Yeah. Marcel Duchamp, the founder of conceptualism in, you know, 1917 yeah. yet. And then one of my favorite discoveries was that Warhol actually collected both Duchamp, Duchamp's most conceptual work, 
Warhol saw that when he was a teenager in Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. then he collects the most radical 1960s conceptualism, you know, Chris Burden, who had himself crucified on a Volkswagen Beetle as his work of art, mm -hmm. um, you know. Joseph uh, Gossuth, you mentioned. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, so Warhol admired those, the most difficult, thorny mm -hmm. conceptual artists, this supposedly goofy, uh, you know, member of pop culture was collecting the most difficult art of his age. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, um... That's that comes through, and then comes along neo expressionism, <laughs> which is a, a, a sort of a challenge for Warhol because it's not. Um, I mean, it's it's different in some ways than the the kind of art that he was interested in. On the other hand, um, he's intrigued by it too. So here he is uh, with Jean Michel Basquiat and um, the young early Basquiat. As it happens. We have a wonderful Basquiat painting in the museum right now. It'll be on view into July. It's the one on the right there for people who don't know Basquiat's work. And um, it's really quite something. Uh, it's from 1988, which is the year that uh, the Basquiat dies. So, um, and let's not, let's not forget that there's text in that. So it all, it automatically has connections to conceptual art, right? Mm -hmm. To just a few years earlier, text-based art. And in fact, at this very moment, you know, someone like, like, uh, Kruger was doing work that was based, you know, directly on text. So the fact that, and I think that Basquiat had somewhat more text in his work than most uh, painters of that early eighties moment. Oh yeah, a lot, especially in the drawings too. They're almost, there's more text than drawing sometimes. I mean, I've argued that the really, the way to understand Basquiat is as a conceptual artist more than anything else. I think that the, the expressionism is a, a little bit of a red herring. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Basquiat. Yeah, no, I would agree. No, I, I think he's a terrific, he's a brilliant artist. Um, so this is a bit, a bit later. Um, Basquiat, you point out that he actually, Basquiat rents a giant studio from Warhol and uh, I think um, in the Bowery or the Lower East Side or somewhere. Yeah, on Jones Street, yeah. uh, just off and, the Bowery. And then they collaborate on some pieces. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the collaborations as visual objects in a sense, but I think that Warhol, I mean, I think Warhol, I know Warhol had big problems as many, many conceptualists and sort of 60s avant-gardists had problems with the return of painting. And I think Warhol was kind of puzzled by the return of painting. But I think he was very interested in Basquiat as a figure that reminded him a lot of himself, even in the 50s. That is Basquiat's blackness, I think, reminded him of, of his own uh, gay uh, nature, gay problem, if you will, in the 50s and 60s. That is not being allowed to be in the mainstream. And uh, a, um, a colleague of, of Basquiat's, you know, Fab Five Freddy, one of the kind of seminal figures in graffiti art and in hip hop, uh, to my surprise, when I interviewed him, said exactly that about his feelings about Warhol. Warhol was a hero to these black street artists. And he said that was partly because they felt a real commonality with his outsiderism with the fact that he was a gay man trying to break into the mainstream art world, just as they were black men trying and, and often being refused entry into the mainstream uh, art world. So I think that was very important for Warhol in understanding Basquiat's moves and Basquiat's work. And I've got a feeling that Warhol could actually see the conceptualism in Basquiat and realize that that made him a more interesting artist to my eyes and to his, in fact, than someone like, um, like Schnabel. Mm -hmm. Like Julian Schnabel, who was a real, uh, if you like, painter's painter, but for Warhol, I think that made him problematic. And mm -hmm. and in the diaries, you can tell that he's got he's much less interested in Bas in uh, Schnabel than he is in Basquiat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, this is one of their collaborations. In case people didn't um, didn't get that, so these are paintings they painted together. As you can see from the previous slide, uh, often they're 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 quite large too. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a performative element, and this will bring us to our next body of images. It, I think it matters, the final product matters maybe less even than the fact that this older gay artist and this young black artist are collaborating. That is, that's always the case with collaboration. There's mm -hmm. a performative quality to working together, to erasing each other's work, to canceling mm -hmm. it out. Yeah. So that ballet, I think, mattered as much. Their presence in the culture as two artists doing this thing mattered as much as any final result. There's a photograph I don't have, but you'll know. Um, it's of uh, Warhol and Basquiat holding up boxing gloves. Do you know the story behind that photo? I've always wondered about that. Because being a performative and that sort of, you know, fighting back aspect. 
Yeah, it was for a show. And you know what, I'm going to, because I, anything I didn't write in my book, I managed to forget more quickly than the things I did write about in my book, um, because there's just so much material. But I'm pretty sure that was for the Tony Shafrazi show. Uh-huh, okay. That makes sense. And it was a staged moment, uh -huh. kind of goofy. And I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with it, even. Uh -huh. They also produced a series of, of actual punching bags. It seems mm -hmm. a little obvious for Warhol, but it is a gesture of entry into pop culture, being willing to present yourself, in a sense, not as the famous painter holding the paintbrush, but as someone willing to do something goofy just to be in the culture. He's like the last guy to be a boxer, Warhol, it seems like. And, you know, we That's haven't gotten to into it, but of course, after the shooting by Valerie Solanas, he's, he's not a very healthy man through the 1970s and 80s. He never fully recovers from um, the, the gunshot wound at that time, as you, as you say. Yeah, although it's strange because he gets this personal trainer and this, um, there's this amazing outtakes from one of Warhol's TV shows mm -hmm. where the trainer says, OK, Andy, do some push ups. And he says, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know. I don't I can. I don't know how many I can do. And then he does. I think the number is 42 push ups. Yeah, yeah. that's that's what it is. I, I, I read that, too. You say he does 42, which is I, you know, I'm not doing 42. <laughs> yeah, he's already, he does, he's a man who had almost di died from, from being shot and then was recovering from a bullet wound and yet managed to do 42 push-ups. Yeah. Um, one of the things the book uh, documents so well is that there's not just one Andy Warhol. There's, there's different Andy Warhols and each one, um, it's, he sort of self-consciously, carefully, um, reinvents himself time and time again. So um, we pulled together this this scrapbook of of Warhol and some different times. And if you if you could, could you go through it and just talk about a, a few of these? And I've got a few more, you know, that we we previewed earlier. Yeah, I mean, I love the one at the, the top left. One of the pleasures of writing the book was that I got to put on a sort of my cultural historian hat as well as my art historian hat. And it was just amazing. Every time you dug into some feature of Warhol as a public figure, you realize that at the very moment where he's doing something, it's incredibly vexed and interesting. So he's wearing that striped shirt, which Gene Seberg had recently worn in, in um, Abu Dzouf in Breathless, right? This yeah. was her signature shirt in a great, great French Nouvelle Vague movie, and he puts it on. So there's gender bending involved, but it's also Picasso's signature shirt especially at just this moment. It's the signature shirt of the late Picasso. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he's straddling those two worlds. Um, the other thing that I love about the images you've selected is that I think he's wearing exactly the same dark glasses, even though the <laughs> span, I think, four years worth of photographs, I think that's right, three or four years worth of photographs, he's wearing exactly the same dark glasses. And another fabulous piece of research I did, and this just came to me completely out of the blue. I was at the museum and I suddenly realized that I don't know why I wanted to take these glasses to an optometrist and see, just have them tell me about them. So I took with the archivist, we went over to a neighborhood optometrist. It turns out all of the sunglasses had very, very strong prescription lenses. So once Andy, he, had, he was ferociously farsighted, or sorry, nearsighted. He couldn't see anything that was like more than a foot away from him. So if he got up in the morning and chose those glasses, he couldn't take them off because he was blind as a bat without having them on, right? Mm -hmm. So in fact, the notion that he, he wore these glasses to be a cool cat was clearly true, but he also wore them because he couldn't take them off once he had them on. Um, the typical kind of obfuscation that Andy engaged in. You know, another funny thing that always strikes me about him is that he thought of himself as a hideous, as hideous. And yet again and again, as in the picture at bottom left, I think he actually is pretty good looking. And mm -hmm. some of his boyfriends said they always thought he was, he was pretty. He has a lovely, very full mouth, right? Kind of Slavic high cheekbones. Yeah, you know, you have to remember that in, he got to see himself every morning as a completely bald man. And let me tell you, bald men are never or not usually fall, fond of their baldness. Um, so every one of these pictures is him wearing a wig. And you can see that in each one, it's a little bit different, right? He's wearing the platinum mm -hmm. wig at top left, but at bottom, uh, sorry, top left. And, but at bottom left, he's only got a few platinum strands. And in the center, he's actually completely dark in back. Now that's just the wig he had to have made by a very mainstream wig maker who made him his wigs and charged him a fortune for these wigs. But see, Warhol thought that if you made it 
so obvious that you were wearing a wig. No one would think you were wearing a toupee. They thought you were wearing this crazy thing in order to be cool, not because you needed to cut up, cover up your baldness. And if you were wearing a silver wig on top of dark hair, it was clearly because your real hair was dark and then you had a silly silver wig on top of it, right? <laughs> so he camouflaged his own baldness in just brilliant, brilliant ways. Um, there see. it is. Um... So we've got Warhol um, in the factory there. And it looks like Gerard Malanga on the right and maybe Billy Name on the left, perhaps. I'm not sure. Name, that's, that's his, um, oh no, my, is, is the name gonna be gone? Last name, Fagan. Um, oh, Fagan. Tony? No, Philip Fagan. Philip Fagan, oh, okay. He was the boyfriend that looked like the tough guy in the, um, in the- um, yeah, Most Wanted Men um, poster. And yeah. he, he has a big uh, skull with wings on his on tattoo on his arm. He looks like a total tough guy. He mm -hmm. won Texas speed motorcycle speed racing uh, awards, but it turns out when you do research on him, he was also a ballet dancer and a mime. Mm -hmm. So he's an incredibly interesting figure that's halfway between a tough guy and and a uh, uh, queer, a very visibly queer figure. Back mm -hmm. up just one image because I want to mention one thing. Oh, okay, yeah, which is. Very important to understanding Andy Warhol. Oops. That is Warhol's a filmmaker, which I dwell on in the book. And it's really important to recognize that Warhol's greatness, he's clearly as great a filmmaker as he is a painter. Um, and his films are truly revolutionary in the mid 60s. Um, I've watched all of Sleep for five and a half hours. I watched all of Empire. Sleep is just Warhol's boyfriend naked, sleeping, being filmed in a way for five and a half hours, being presented to us for five and a half hours. And Warhol's film Empire is just eight hours of straight footage of the Empire State Building. The camera doesn't move, you just watch the Empire State Building. And I've done it and I can tell you it's a fabulous thing to do <laughs> to watch this thing. But those movies, I mean, ask any, any avant-garde filmmaker and they'll tell you these are, you know, as important to film as the Mona Lisa is to painting. Really yeah. makes works. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, and that's the juxtaposition here. It's Warhol in the factory with the Brillo box and then Warhol in the factory um, with the Bolex film camera. And he abandons painting for sure, pretends to abandon or kind of abandons painting mm -hmm. for filmmaking. And it's clear that he just thought there was more room to move in filmmaking. There mm -hmm. were problems that, with painting. That that's just for about, for about four years or something where he sort of pretends to abandon painting. Yeah, that's right. He always sort of pretends that painting isn't worth his trouble, but he, he keeps painting. But to a certain extent, he keeps painting to fund other elements in his art making. You know, mm -hmm. think of Urshak blots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a cat there, too, and you tell the story of Warhol's cats at home. Yeah. Um, all named Sam. Twenty What, 25 cats named Sam? <laughs> well, or 17, I was able to document. 17, okay, 17. <laughs> if you could see the first draft of my book, the cat chapter goes on. It already is way too long. But it went on and on and on and on. The researching Warhol's cats was a huge pleasure, let me tell you. Okay, well, I'm a cat person, so. I, I am too. I've got my door closed so my two cats can't come in and bother me. Yeah, you know. So here we've got, and we've got the flowers here again. People can see too, like we've got the small ones and we've got the big ones and then we've got the medium sized ones. And then we have Warhol as the publisher of Interview. Yeah, holding a flower, of course. And, and the nice thing about that image, it looks like just Warhol being Warhol, right? Not being the crazy cat, not being the cool cat, being a kind of average schlubby guy who's stuck having a blonde wig on his head, I think, right? He's, mm -hmm. He talked about being forced to, to uh, wear his Warhol, his Andy costume every day, even when he uh -huh. didn't. But I just realized we're running out of time and I do want to answer some questions. So okay, let's do that. That's not a bad, bad, oh, well, here we are. I think we're at the end. Yeah. And here's, yeah, here's Warhol in public after he's dead in a way. This is the Warhol we know, the Warhol in the fright wig, surrounded by admirers and puzzled admirers, I bet. Being, mm -hmm. I love the selfie being taken or, or the photo being taken on the cell phone at far left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, well, we've got, um, we've got some questions here. There's one, um, you mentioned um, a question about um, the Alice Neal portrait that Warhol sat for, showing his attack. Um, that's interesting. What's what's the story with that? Yeah, one of the things that, I don't know if Warhol liked to say this, but other people always said that he was sort of ashamed of his scars and didn't like to show them, except that there's photograph after photograph after photograph of him showing them for publication in magazines. And he, he goes to one of the most interesting um, uh, portrait painters of his era, and he was smart enough to realize before most people did how good she mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think some people, 
realized that she was a vitally important figure, but not everyone in 1970. Oh, it was late, 71, I think. So two years, after, three years after the shooting, I believe. And he takes his shirt off and lets her show him mm -hmm. in this really vulnerable way, you know? But you have to realize that Warhol is once again presenting himself, right? He didn't mm -hmm. have to do that. He could probably have told her, I refuse to allow you to show that image. Um, but he was happy to be seen in yet a new light and probably happy, frankly, to be seen in his wounded state to say, wait a minute, this woman really did a number on me, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I almost died. The surgery was just brutal and he continued to have surgeries. You know, he had to have a second surgery to correct problems from the first one. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just another element in the sheer complexity of Warhol's mm -hmm. relationship to his own body, to bodies, to other artists. Um, after all, he's being presented as, a, in a sense, a great, important artist by virtue of being painted by Alice Neal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's another interesting one here, too. Um, you had mentioned the question, the importance of subtext in Warhol's work. Um, and then do you feel the factory cr crew or others helped encourage Warhol uh, to develop the subtext? And this gets into this whole question of where do the ideas come from? Because he often talks about asking other people, what should I paint? What should I paint? Um, what was was he really to what extent is he are they his ideas and to what extent is he selecting them from other people and distilling them what would you say about that you know that's a complicated question um you know i think he once said what's the difference between looking through books art history books for ideas and asking the people around you for ideas right mm -hmm. you're just you're taking things in from the world you know he was offered and came up with hundreds if not thousands of ideas that he didn't follow up on right, right. He could recognize a good idea. You talk about time. him putting them in his diaries too, different ideas for, for works. Yeah, there's a kind of almost embarrassing idea book from probably just after the shooting where he's writing down some ideas that would have been very radical, you know, making images of, of ejaculation, but others that just sound really silly, um, good ideas for films. And, you know, um, people were constantly throwing ideas at him that were not good ideas that he was rejecting. You know, I think the influence of other people on him is much, much less, shall we say, than the influence of him on other people. And it's not as though these people suggesting ideas to him then went off and made amazing art, except with a few exceptions, you know, um, uh, the Velvet Underground obviously made, made great art uh, of their own kind. Um, and there are great photographers around him, but mostly the people who claim to have been the real Warhol behind Warhol weirdly didn't do very much when they didn't have Warhol around. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, as I said earlier, the assistantship that he had was much more limited than people think. He never just surrendered completely to assistance and just said, make my art. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. When he did that, that was a conceptual gesture anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There, there's another, and we'll just, we're getting, getting close, but I want to run just a few more. There's a, a question here that links up maybe to this picture, and that is about the digital world and NFTs and multiples here with the internet. Um, you know, we have so many versions of things and things are infinitely repeatable in the digital sphere. And they they're, seem to be finding ways to quantify them still. And then there's the head scratching emergence of crypto art and NFTs. How do you think Warhol would respond to these phenomena? I think he would have had virtually no interest in them simply because they're too much, they're too accepted, they're easy. Right, the mm -hmm. NFTs in a sense, the problem with NFTs is that they're not challenging. They're completely at one with the commercial you know, world of cap late capitalism. So I think Warhol would have seen that there was very little to move in these, these forums that had already been completely absorbed into popular culture. I mean, I think making, mm -hmm. image, making NFTs in 2021 is a completely different thing than doing the race riot pictures in 1963. So to the extent that one could imagine him alive today, you know, I think he would have been doing, you know what, he's, if, if I could say what Warhol was doing, I would do it and be a genius artist. But the point <laughs> is that he always did things that were more interesting than anyone else could imagine. Ergo, I can't yeah. imagine what he'd be doing because it would be too interesting for me to imagine it. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. And there was a question that came in early that I think you've kind of answered, but I think it is still an important one to reemphasize. And that is about, um, is there a single event that precipitated the change from Warhol, the commercial graphic artist of the 50s into Warhol, the Warhol persona, or was it a gradual transformation? Uh, it was fairly sudden, really. I mean, it was the transformation is 
Warhol, the commercial artist who's doing fine art. He has eight, eight shows, I think, in the 50s. No one realizes that. Mm -hmm. But he's showing, frankly, uh, radical gay art. He's showing, you know, trying to show at least boys kissing. So mm -hmm. that was going nowhere for him. And he realizes there's something else going on. And he, he is hugely influenced by Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns and becomes one of the very, very first pop artists. And I talk a lot about a moment where he takes art that he made or showed in a store window and realizes, aha, this can be a whole new kind of art called, for want of a better word, pop art. Mm -hmm. um, so he becomes, the persona changes at just the moment that he changes who he is in the art world as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course the 60s was a time of change and personas, I mean, think of Bob Dylan changing his persona. Think mm -hmm. of the Beatles adopt becoming the Beatles. I mean, if you look at them at the Star Club in Hamburg, they're totally different characters than the guys wearing the velvet collared suits, Beatles suits, you know, and singing Love, Love Me Do. So mm -hmm. the creation of personas was crucially important at just that moment. And mm -hmm. Warhol was much older than those, uh, those other figures, realizes there's something to be done with that. Mm -hmm. And also the mm -hmm. most exciting conceptual artists were playing with that at just that moment. It was mm -hmm. the cutting edge of the avant-garde, the cutting edge of the cutting edge was playing with personas, refusing to make objects at all, but just presenting yourself as the work of art. So mm -hmm. Warhol would have understood that. I mean, in fact, Yves Klein, yes, he makes works of art, but he is just as important as a figure as the work he makes. And Warhol, I think, cottoned on to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and I wanna jump to, um, I'm gonna ask a last question. Um, I put this up here, the shadow paintings. We, we started with, or I'm kind of springing this on you a little bit, but um, I can, yeah, uh, I can remember that. We, start, yeah, we started with some of the uh, early, late work and um, this is such an interesting body of works. So I had a chance to see it installed at the Dia Foundation in um, upstate or up, up the Hudson River at one point. And it's, it's a very sort of utterly Warhol and very un-Warhol Warhol. So could you just talk a little bit about this and then we'll, we'll call it a day. Yeah, I mean, it's great to end with because like, and you know, we started with the Rorschachs, which are difficult, but the shadows are even more difficult to figure out. What are they a shadow of? Are they a shadow of anything? Are they, I mean, you know, in this image, they look pretty damn difficult and tough. You could even see a, a Ku Klux Klan hood in there. Their shadows, by definition, are difficult, dark things, right? They're about the absence of light. And yet some of them are incredibly uh, decorative. And Warhol said, and I would say Warhol lied, uh, by pretending that he thought they were disco decor, right? Because this is just mm -hmm. the great, they're made at just the great moment of disco where he's showing up at Studio 54. I don't think that was true of them, but they could play that role. So they're decorative and deep, just like the Rorschachs are. Um, they are, and they're just incredibly exciting and beautiful to be in a room with them. There are 102 of them. And I saw them at Dia, but also at the Hirschhorn Museum, whose galleries are entirely circular. And there was something mm -hmm. completely magical about going around and around and around and seeing these same paintings. They're also cinematic. They look so much like frames from a movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think they're changing from image to image, but they aren't. But they really feel like the stuttering frames from, from one of Warhol's movies, right? Who makes movies where every single frame will look almost <laughs> identical? Andy Warhol, right? So they're totally self-referential. They are, they are works of genius that look unbelievably stupid. And you can imagine the people going into Adia even writing comments saying like, what the hell is it with 102 images that are barely different? Mm -hmm. um, they always, Warhol always straddles the idiotic and the incredibly profound. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and another thing too, um, they're all, of course, like everything that Warhol does pretty much, they're, they're photographs. Um, yes, that's right. That, um, and they are, um, they are, they photograph really well too, which is interesting. Looking, combing through um, pieces for the, uh, for this PowerPoint, I, yeah, I noticed again and again, installation views of Warhol's art always look great. And that, I mean, I think he was canny enough to realize, I mean, after all, he spent the 50s uh, in a world of reproduction of his illustrations. Mm -hmm. I think he was canny enough to realize that in the 1960s, by the 1960s, as they do today, things circulate not in their objecthood, but in their reproducibility, in their, mm -hmm. in their place in the, in the culture of, of print. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he realized exactly that. But having said which, you can go too far with that. In fact, they always, there's always payout if you go to see the things in the flesh. 
Mm-hmm. That there's always something different that happens when you see a Warhol in the flesh and you see it in reproduction. For instance, the scale. I mean, these are very large paintings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. we saw that earlier with the, with the race riots. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. while they're both completely about being reproduced, they're also completely about living in a museum space. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that makes them exciting. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Blake. This has been terrific. Um, the book Absolutely. the book has so much in it, and um, this talk has been wonderful. Um, you make a, a strong case. I mean, Warhol is just inescapable. As a, You make the case that he is, uh, along with Picasso, really the most influential artist of the 20th century. And yeah, that's, that's my argument. I mean, uh, absolutely. I should say, uh, lest my publisher cut my head off, that my um, paperback <laughs> just came out. So this is a good moment yep. to, to buy the paperback, which of course is cheaper than the, the hardback. Mm-hmm. Uh, the hardback is more substantial. You'll be reading this book so many times, you really need to get the hardback or it'll just fall apart. Right. And you should also, if you get the paper version, um, you should download the, the PDF that has all of the footnotes to it because the footnotes are really very important. I read the, I read the book on the, actually deliberately bought the um the you know Apple Books version because I knew I was going to want to look at all of the other uh, references and there's almost as many pages of references um, as there are the 970 some pages of the of the narrative itself and it is really valuable to be able to see who said what and where and a lot of background notes and Blake you said you were adding a lot of new information to the the um, the notes too. Yeah, the latest, there is a PDF of the notes, which is corrected and up to date and has lots of information that just didn't fit in the book. So some of the notes just tell you who I'm quoting, but some of them go on for a page about, you know, giving lots more information about the background to works and claims that I'm making. Um, And those are available um, at harpercollins.com slash Warhol. And I frequently write new little things about Warhol discoveries I've made, and that's available at warholiana.com where there's also corrections to the book and addenda to the book. So there's warholiana.com is a great place to sort of the clearinghouse for my book with lots of new information. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much. And we will say um, goodbye. Thank you everyone for watching and uh, go buy Blake's book. You will not regret it. Next time in person, I'm desperate to get to Eugene. I've never been there. We'll figure out a way to get you out here. Okay. Someday we'll be able to do these things again. We will. Thank you okay. All. Thank you for Bye-bye. having me.